Last time we finished chapter 6. Chapter 6 gave us two things. It gave us a complete treatment of linear congruences, culminating in theorem 6.3. Theorem 6.3 told us exactly when combination with 6.2 before it, it tells us exactly when a linear congruence like that has solutions. It's when the GCD of A and N divides B. And in that case, it tells you exactly what the solutions are, okay? There are D solutions, and they're given by this formula here, parameterized by I, 0 through D minus 1, and T, the missing ingredient there, is the unique solution you get from the reduced complex after you divide it out by the GCD, so that this, this one here, we now have the coefficient of x being co-prime to the modulus. So that was the first thing, that was the first thing chapter, chapter six gives, okay? The second thing is the Chinese remainder theorem. Sorry guys, Sarah, Oliver, sorry. And um, the second thing that gives us is Chinese remainder theorem. Okay. So this is a theorem that, uh, that links together statements about congruence classes. If we have a bunch of simultaneous congruences modulo a set of a set of moduli m1 through mk, and if moreover we know that these are pairwise co-prime, meaning if you take any pair of them, they have a GCD equals one. The Chinese remainder theorem tells us that there will be a unique solution to this simultaneous set of equations, a unique congruence class which satisfies all of them. But modulo what? Modulo their product. And I explained last time how this would be useful to us when we come to solving a general polynomial congruence because we're tackle a general polynomial congruence modulo any modulus by looking at the prime factorization of its modulus and considering a bunch of subproblems modulo each prime power. And the different prime powers will of course be uh, pairwise co-prime if you different primes. So that was the result from chapter six and we have this nice it all boils down to the way the simultaneous solution x is constructed. Here, we spent some time with this in the tutorials as well. Uh, this, is the, this is the number that simultaneously satisfies each, each of the sub each of the sub -constances. Okay, so coming on to chapter seven. So chapter seven steps up from the case of linear congruences, and we come on to talk about a uh, general case, okay? polynomials of any degree and ultimately polynomials modulo any modulus. Okay? But for now, we, we, we restrict to thinking about the case of where the modulus is a prime number. Now, I did say before how where you have the, the situation with, poly, with polynomial congruences is, diff, is, is kind of different to the situation with polynomial equations. When you've got polynomial equations, we always know that the degree of the polynomial corresponds to the total number of solutions that the polynomial has in the complex numbers. When you count the solutions up with their multiplicities. So a polynomial of degree five has five solutions in the complex numbers. Polynomial of degree seven is seven solutions. Well, we've already seen with our with, our, with some of the examples we've looked at, that there's no such clear direct link for polynomial congruences, okay? So, just to emphasize that, we've seen, we've seen examples of polynomials congruent to zero modulo n, which have more and less solutions than the degree of f. In one case, we said, you know, some polynomials don't have any solutions. Some polynomial congruences don't have any solutions. 
And there was one small example we looked at at the start of the last chapter, polynomial uh, 08, I think, where it had four, it was a quadratic polynomial and it had four solutions. So there's no clear, simple link in general between the degree and the number of solutions that these things have, okay? But when we consider prime moduli, prime modulus, f of x comma to zero modulo p, so of course we see p, it's of course the prime number, then we do have a result. We have a result called Lagrange's theorem, which is this uh, result here, theorem 7.1, which says, not that it doesn't tell you how many solutions this thing has, but it gives you an upper bound. The degree, the degree of f as a polynomial, so the, 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 the highest order power of x that there is in there. The degree of f is an upper bound for the number of solutions, or the number of solutions of f of x comma to zero mod p. So we'll have less than or equal to p solutions. So there will exist less than or equal to p solutions. Providing, now there's one extra little technical condition, providing we'll say f of x, how are we? Uh, some ai xi. That's the standard way we're going to um, represent our polynomials. It's going to degree n. Sorry, not less than or equal to n p solutions. Less than or equal to n solutions. The degree of, sorry, p is the modulus, so it's the degree of f. Providing that where, where the polynomial is written like this, that P does not divide the leading coefficient a n. So P must not divide the leading coefficient a n. Why is that there? What, what would be the case if P did divide the leading coefficient? If P did divide the, the leading coefficient, that would mean a n was congruent to zero mod P. So effectively, your first coefficient multiplying the leading term x to the power n, your first coefficient in the polynomial would, would be zero. So that would mean your polynomial wouldn't really be a degree n, it would be a degree at most n minus one, okay? Put that remark in brackets here. If p does divide, if p, p does divide a n, i.e. a n is congruent to zero mod p, then f of x will be congruent to, well, we don't need to include the last term because it's only congruent to zero. Yes, the n might not be congruent to zero mod p, but if, if it's multiplied by a n, which is congruent to zero, then there's no need to include it. It doesn't contribute to the value when you evaluate it as a, as a congruence. I.e. f not really of degree n. I mean, I can write down a polynomial of zero x cubed plus x squared plus one. Okay. That's not a cubic. I've mentioned an x cubed term, but I've got a zero coefficient on it. So this is really a cubic. It would be at most, uh, at most a quadratic coefficient. Okay, so this is the result. A polynomial congruence modulo p of degree n and really of degree n, so the nth coefficient, the, the leading coefficient is, is not common to zero. Um, such a thing has at most n solutions. And we can prove this, and it's a really nice application of proof by induction. Okay. So it's a really good application of 
Well, a couple of things. Proof by induction. And some algebraic factoring results. In particular, this one we've seen, seen a number of times where you've got um, any A to the any power B. So any difference of powers, always fact, you can always take the factor A minus B out of it. We've encountered this quite a few times. Uh, J from zero to M minus one. <coughs> A to the power of M minus one minus J, B to the power of J. You, you're most familiar with this result in the case of the difference of squares. A squared minus B squared equals A minus B into A plus B. Or A cubed minus B cubed equals A minus B into A squared plus AB plus B squared. Those are the first two. Probably not familiar with those, but it works for any power, okay? And the the, the, the other factor can be fairly nicely described uh, like that. Okay, so the proof is a really good, really good application, really good illustration of some of these the concepts work. Okay. Now, what do we perform induction on? So we induct on, on N, which is the degree of F. Okay. So our base case, base case is N, N equals uh, one, polynomials of degree one, i.e. linear polynomials. So a linear polynomial looks like um, a1 times x plus an a0 congruent to 0 modulo p. But remember the condition, we're also assuming that p does not divide the leading coefficient a1. Now, how many solutions does that have? Okay. Well, we understand that case completely. We just spent chapter six talking about the linear congruences. Okay, so we we completely understand these now. This has the criteria for the existence of solutions. Is you look at the GCD of the coefficient of x and the modulus, and you ask, does that GCD divide the constant coefficient? If it does, then there are solutions. If it doesn't, then there aren't. But now we're told the modulus p is a prime, it doesn't divide a1. So i.e. that means that's the same as saying the GCD of p and a1 is 1. So it's one of these most straightforward cases where the GCD is 1. Of course, 1 divides a0, 1 divides everything. So there are solutions. And indeed, there we can say exactly what they are in terms of the inverse of A1. So A1 inverse mod P exists. And this has one solution. Exactly one solution. X congruent to minus A1 inverse A0. Much of P. Okay. So it has exactly one solution. Polynomial of degree one having one solution. So that proves the base case. The theorem says that the degree of the polynomial is going to be an upper bound on the number of solutions. Okay. Well, here's something of degree one, which has one solution. So that satisfies the theorem in this case. Okay. Yes? So the base, so we're we're, in, we're performing induction on n, the degree of f. The possibilities for the degree of a polynomial are 1, 2, up as far as any, you know, any number. So we're going to do induction on that number. So the base case is n equals 1, polynomials of degree 1. That's linear polynomial, polynomials looking like that. Now, we're, 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 one of the assumptions of the theorem is that p does not divide the leading coefficient. So in this case, that means p does not divide a. So then A1 inverse exists, because P and A1 are co-prime. 
that's the criteria of the existence of inverse. So A1 inverse exists. So you can multiply both sides, you know, take the A naught over the other side and multiply both sides by A1 inverse. And you're left with X is congruent to this number. Whatever it is. So there is one solution because, you know, if, if X satisfies that, X must be congruent to it. That means there's one solution. There can't be more than one solution because whatever solution, X solves this, it must be congruent to this. So it only comes from the single congruence. Okay. So the theorem is true for theorem is true for n equals one. Because there's only one solution and the thing is up to be one. So that's good. That's a good start to your proof by induction. You always want to get the base case. Prove the base case first of all. And it's proved by the, by the theory that we've already developed, by the, the, our, our work with the linear congruences in, in the previous chapter. So now this is a proof by induction. It's, it's a sophisticated one, but it still follows the same uh, scaffolding that we have from our previous uses of uh, proof by induction. So we now assume Now assume the theorem is true for polys of degree of degree n not equal to one now, but n equal to k for some k in the relevant range, some k equal to one. We're allowed to make this assumption because we know it's true for polynomials of degree one, so it's not a it's not an invalid assumption. Now we loosen the focus on one and we just say, well, it's true for all polynomials of some degree of, of degree k. Now I spell out in, in the notes exactly what that means, but just very quickly summarize it, i.e. all polys of degree k have at most k solutions. Yeah, that's what the theorem says. And including this technical thing here that P does not divide the leading coefficient. If he did divide the leading coefficient, it wouldn't really be of degree K, it would be of some lesser degree. So that's what we're assuming here. All polynomials of degree K have at most K, K, K solutions. Okay. So now we will we will use this assumption. We will use this assumption to prove the theorem for all polys of degree k plus one. You have to go one step further. You have to show the, the, the key principle of induction that the truth of early cases implies the truth of later cases. Because the base case is true, then it, the truth kind of sweeps up. All the but how are we going to do it? How are we going to prove something for all polynomials of degree k plus one? Well, for this, we're going to use proof by induction. Okay. Proof by proof by contradiction. Good way of proving that. All polynomials of degree k plus one have at most k plus one solutions is to prove that if it were not true, we would get a contradiction. Okay. So assume, and this is a wrong assumption, but we're doing it for the purposes of proof by contradiction. Assume there is a poly of degree k plus one. Let's start naming it. It's called g of x. So it's g of x equal the sum from i equals 0 to k plus 1. And I'm calling the coefficient b, bi x to the power i. It's one that the theorem applies to. So p does not divide k plus b, k plus 1, the leading coefficient. So there's, a, there's what looks like a general polynomial of degree k plus 1. That has too many solutions. Okay. 
i.e. solutions x congruent to, so we've got a bunch of solutions here, x0, x1, x2, all the way up as far as xk plus 1, so that these are solutions modulo p. How many solutions have I written down there? I've begun at 0, gone to k plus 1, so k plus 2 solutions. Okay, so that's looking like too many solutions. The theorem says these things, polynomials of degree k plus 1, have at most k plus 1 solutions. So here's a rogue bad one. Yeah? It's a bad apple. It shouldn't exist. We're assuming it exists for the purposes of proof by contradiction. Okay, so all these solutions are all different congruent classes mod p. They're all distinct solutions. Okay. Remember, two integers that are valid. If, if you've got one integer solution to a polynomial, any other integer that's congruent to it will also be a solution. So we only count solutions as being different if they're not congruent to one another. Otherwise, they're just different instances of the same solution, different re representatives of the same solution. So, so this kind of polynomial shouldn't exist. But we're assuming it does for the moment. Okay? Now, what, what are we going to be contradicting? And um, what we're going to be contradicting is the induction assumption we just made. So we, we will show that this, this being this assumption, contradicts the induction assumption. The induction assumption is just take an error to it. We're up here where we assumed that the theorem was true for all polynomials of degree k. So, i.e., we must construct a bad polynomial, meaning one that has too many solutions, a bad polynomial of degree k from the bad polynomial of degree k plus 1, which is g. Construct a bad polynomial of degree k from the bad polynomial of degree k plus 1. Bad meaning it has too many solutions than the theorem says it should have. So this is all just about getting all the logic, logical framework of the proof by induction set up properly. So we prove the base case. We make the assumption that the result is true for all polynomials of degree k. So all polynomials of degree k are good. They have, they have at most k solutions. We now attempting to show that that implies all polynomials of degree k plus 1 are also good. How are we going to do that? We're going to assume there is a bad one. We know there shouldn't be, but we assume temporarily there is a bad one. It shows that that assumption forces us to conclude there must be a bad polynomial of degree k. But you see, we just assumed there weren't any. So that shows that under the induction assumption, you can't, this, this assumption is self-contradictory. So that will show that the induction assumption proves that this is false. So therefore, all polynomials of degree k plus 1 are also good. So how do we get to our bad, our bad polynomial? Well, we need to get there in a couple of stages. So we define a new polynomial. polynomial g, and this still is degree k plus 1. We're not yet down. We're not yet down to degree k. So we simply subtract a constant from g. So we take one of the solutions, 
take the first solution on our list, which is essentially just one of our solutions, and we subtract the, the constant that you get when you evaluate the polynomial of G, we subtract that from the original polynomial of G. Okay? So X is our variable of the polynomial here, where we're subtracting uh, G of X of zero. So remember, G of X is this polynomial sum from I to K plus one, A I X to the I. G of X zero, of course, will be sum from zero to K plus one, A I X zero to the I. That's sum we can organize into single summation. by just collecting together, you know, AI is a common factor there. So you've got X to the I minus X zero to the I. So this is our new polynomial of degree G, sorry, of degree K plus one, the polynomial capital G. And what have we done, done to it? We've subtracted a certain constant from it. Still a polynomial of degree K plus one. But it now looks very factorizable because it's a sum of terms, each of which is a difference of powers. Each of those terms we're able to factorize. Actually, uh, I didn't do it there, but we can, if we want, we can omit the zero, the i equals zero term. Because when you got i equals zero, you've got x, whatever it is, to the zero minus x zero to the zero. So something to the zero is one. So you just got one minus one in the bracket. So it, it actually turns out there is no constant term here because when you when you evaluate it at i equals zero, you get, you get, uh, you get zero in that bracket. So if you like, in, in the notes, I've adapted it slightly so that the summation but it's not a mistake to say it begins at zero. But that's by the by. Um, so this can be factorized. I mean, if we really did want to, we don't really need to see the guts of it, but um, it would factorize like take x minus x0 out of each one, and then you've got a summation j going from 0, it's going up to i, and it's got the usual thing, x to the i minus 1 minus j, x0 to the j. So that's applying that factorization result. Okay, the differences of powers always factorize. You can at least take out the, the factor x, the, the factor of the difference one. Now that factor x minus x naught is, is exactly the same. You see, it doesn't depend on i anymore. It's always sitting there. So that can come out to the front. I'm oh, sorry, in the, in the, all these ai's should be b's. Sorry, g was constructed with, with b's. I mean, it's not me. Um, so what do we got here? Then we just got zero to k plus one, bi multiplying this big, this big bracket. There's no need to write it back. Now, we want to make observations about this polynomial. We call that polynomial H. That's polynomial H of X. So observations about H. What degree does it have? Well, we just um, 
We just started with a polynomial capital G, which had degree K, and we factorized a linear factor, X minus a constant K. So the thing it leaves behind must have degree K minus one. Sorry, uh, K, uh, just degree K. G was a degree K plus one. We factorized one factor X out of it. So H of X has degree K. You can see that because I, that the maximum index I reaches is K plus one. And then the maximum index you reach on X here, when I is equal to K plus one, it's when J equals zero and you've got K plus one minus one, so you've got X to the K. So it's the maximum index you can, the maximum power on X you can encounter in this, in this expression. And uh, the degree of H is, is K. The leading coefficient of H What's the leading coefficient of h? Well, it's, it's, it's the coefficient of x to the power of k. Uh, well, it's going to be, I mean, the x to the power of k can only occur when i is k plus 1 and j is 0. You get x to the power of k here, x to the 0 to the 0, so it's just 1. But that gets multiplied by bk. So it's, it's lead, sorry, bk plus 1. So its leading coefficient is bk plus 1. And remember, remember, recall, P does not divide BK plus 1. That was part of the assumption when we introduced polynomial little g, the bad polynomial little g. So H is looking like uh, one of the polynomials that the theorem is going to apply to. Moreover, H is a polynomial that our induction assumption is going to apply to because it's a polynomial of degree k. And it's got leading coefficient, which is not divisible by p. But how many solutions does, how many solutions does h have? So let's examine that question. So we've got g of x equal to g of x, little g of x minus g of x zero, and we've now expressed this as x minus x zero times h of x. Now, if you evaluate, um, consider g of x j, Remember, we had these all these solutions, x0, x1, x2, up to xk plus 1. Of, these were solutions of little g. Little g congruent to 0. So this is equal to g of xj minus g of x0. But well, that's going to be congruent to 0 modulo p. Okay, because both. As gxj is congruent to zero and gx naught is congruent to zero. Well, okay. So that's for each j from one to k plus one. So that implies that xj minus x naught times h of xj is congruent to zero. For j equals 1 to k plus 1. Okay, because that's g of x minus g of x naught is equal to x minus x naught times h of x. So when we uh, evaluate capital G at xj, it's telling us that this product is congruent to 0. I.e., that implies what's the definition of congruence? The definition of congruence, well, being congruent to 0 is that p divides this quantity. P is dividing a product. So the, 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 the quintessential property of prime numbers is when prime numbers divide a product, they must divide one of the factors. Okay? This prime is contained in the, in the product of these two. It must be contained in one of them. You can't have a bit of P in the first factor and a bit of P in the second factor because P doesn't split into bits. It's a prime number. Okay? 
So that means P divides XJ minus X naught or P divides H of XJ. Can P divide XJ minus X naught? Look at where we introduced the, the XJ. They were introduced as the solutions of G of X number to zero. We made the point that G of X had too many solutions. So these were all distinct solutions, all different congruence classes mod P, all of these X, XJs. They all come from different congruence classes. So when P can never divide the difference between XJ and X naught, because if it did, that would mean X naught would be congruent to XJ. But we've assumed they're all different congruence classes. So that implies this cannot happen. So P must divide XJ because XJ is not congruent to X naught mod P for J equals one up to K plus one because we assumed that they were distinct solutions modulo P. So IE, if P divides H of X naught, that's another way of saying that HJ sorry, h of xj, that h of xj is congruent to zero mod p, where j equals one, k plus one. But that looks bad. h of x arrived to us as a polynomial of degree k, leading coefficient is non-zero mod p, how many solutions does it have? It's got at least these, so it's got solutions x, j. How many of them? There's k plus one of them, there's too many. And all the x, j are distinct mod p, where j goes from one to k plus one, i.e. too many solutions. It contradicts the induction assumption. So we've arrived at a contradiction, so we must look at what led to that contradiction. It's not the problem with the induction assumption, because we made a later assumption. We were allowed to make we were allowed to make the induction assumption at the start. We proved the base case. Prove the theorem is true for n equals one. Then the induction assumption just said, well, assume it's true for some unspecified k greater than or equal to one. Then we made a second assumption. The second assumption came here, where we were starting our proof by contradiction. We assumed there was a bad polynomial of degree k plus one, having too many solutions. A little bit of manipulation on this bad polynomial, shifting its value by a constant, but chosen in an appropriate way so that we could factorize it nicely by taking out x minus x naught. But the factor that it left behind, h of x, looked suspicious. When you interrogate h of x, you find it has degree k, and you find it has k plus 1 solutions. But that cannot exist under the deduction assumption. Reason it existed came from the the assumption that there was a bad polynomial of degree k plus one. So that, therefore, the principle of proof, proof by contradiction tells us there cannot be a bad polynomial of degree k plus one under the induction assumption that there's no bad polynomials of degree k. So there cannot be, cannot be a bad poly of degree k plus one under the assumption, the induction assumption, that there's no bad polys of degree k. Because the assumption of a bad polynomial of degree k plus one leads to this polynomial h, which is degree k and also. So that completes the induction step. So theorem true for k, theorem true 
for n equals k implies theorem true for n equals k plus one. So that's achieved the induction, the inductive, the induction step. So by the principle of induction, then always finished. Casting the magic spell at the end. So by principle of induction. Theorem is true for theorem is true for all n trigonal equals one. N is the measure of the degree of a polynomial. So if it's true for all n, it's therefore it's true for all polynomials. I.e., true for all polynomials. So that completes our proof. It's it's a really nice, sophisticated use of proof by induction. It's a bit long, you know. Good. It's proof by induction, which has a substantial proof by contradiction in the middle of it for proving the proving the induction step. So it's a really good, it's I think one of the best arguments in in the notes in, in the course for really displaying the full kind of logical force of of some of these proof techniques, proof by, proof by induction and proof by contradiction. I think it's really quite satisfying the way it works. Though it does, I, I'd advise you to study it closely, get to get to know it, and really appreciate how all the different bits are working and fitting together. Um, okay, when I see you tomorrow, we'll consider the rest of the of the, of the chapter, which deals, which then passes on to general polynomial. Okay. <laughs>